Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. Wow. Well. My Nexus 5X just packed up. Can you, I just, I'm back on my old Nexus 5 temporarily while I'm waiting for a Pixel 2 because I can't get a OnePlus 5. And uh, so this is just a quick test to see if it, anything works. Because this, uh, this has only got 16 megabytes of RAM, so this could be the shortest video ever. But I wanted to uh, keep the old videos going just to show you that I've not lost interest. Because uh, quite often when people do videos, they do a few and then they do a few less and then the next thing you know, they've backed it up, you know. Well, there's plenty going on. There's plenty going on in the dental world. There's always something going on. It's uh, BDIA, <coughs> British BDIA. <coughs> BDTA is really what it is. Dental Showcase. It used to be run by Tony Reid. Last year they sold it to Mark Allen Publications for three, something north of three, four million, I forget what god knows exhibitions are a cash cow aren't they they only used to be dental showcase and then the british dental association decided that they were going to hold a an exhibition so they tried to big that up and then along comes another exhibition firm and decide that they're going to hold another exhibition so all of a sudden we've got three exhibitions a year and then the problem is that the uh the uh, the private one, the corporate one, uh, was very big on CPD because for a while everybody wanted to rack up their CPD. This is before people realised that you could get more CPD than you can shake a stick at online. And so, uh, and then the exhibitors started protesting because they said, I don't know why we're paying all these big commercial prices for stand space when uh, all the uh, exhibitors are not buying stuff they're all in CPD lectures and so that all then they scaled the CPD down a bit and the, the lure of CPD were off so now the commercial thing is not making so much money now so and then the BDA um, <clears throat> was was always a damn squib because they never it was never commercially successful you know because they're not they don't have to be commercially <laughs> successful the BDA they're like the Department of Health. They're like a, almost like a statutory body, you know, that people will pay to join the BDA uh, irrespective of the value that they receive. And the exhibition, the association's sort of annual general meeting was always subsidized by the vocational training budget. And that's the reason why they used to have it on a Friday because Friday was vocational training day. And on, on, on Friday, every vocational trainee in the new scheme was on day release. And they used to be on day release to the local postgraduate centre. But then once a year, the uh, all the vocational trainers who were groaning under the weight of having to try and find of many diverse ways to entertain these new graduates on a Friday, you know, full of enthusiasm for doing uh, the rubber dam and wedging the fillings, the, all the stuff that they were going to have to stop doing as soon as they got into the National Health Service. Um, just, you know, they would. They, the BDA said, oh, "Well, look, guys, why don't you bring them here? Why don't you know, we'll put on a, you know, a VT day on Friday, and every VT scheme in the country can come, and we'll give you free tickets to get into the, <laughs> the exhibition and all the. And because the VT jobs were handed out on the basis of who was a BDA member anyway, it all worked rather well, and so uh, a portion of the VT budget went into the British Dental Association once a year to fund their uh, annual." their annual general meeting and the showcase became a change from the British Dental Trade Association to the British Dental Industries Association I don't I think they didn't like the idea of being called trade you know as in tradesman's entrance so they uh, decided to call themselves an industry although they're not really an industry and uh, that that was really just a load of what you know the real big suppliers your um your curs and your you know uh, uh henry shines and people like that you know almost before dental directory came along and certainly before the, the major sponsors like wrigley and colgate came along and um they <clears throat> wanted to they wanted to showcase their they had all this hardware that uh, was in, you know, they wanted to put in a showroom and they couldn't get, so the only way they could do it is to centralise it and get dentists to come and look at it all in the same place once a year. 
And it worked really well, you know, because it was the only hardware buying opportunity unless you wanted to get on a plane or a train and go to Cologne and look at it all in Germany. But the German stuff was, is, you know, is 10 years in advance of anything we could afford in the UK. It's always been like a poor, a real poor exhibition <laughs> compared to the Cologne, the International Dental Showcase, because over there they, they're making serious money. Whereas in the UK, we we're all on the National Health Service and we're all trying to do everything as cheaply as possible. The most popular stand at uh, Showcase would be a stand that was showing everybody how to spend less, <laughs> how to, you know, how to buy a, a cheaper compressor, or how to buy a cheaper dental chair. Not, not at all interested in quality or, uh, or performance. But it's all about, it's all about the cost, isn't it? It's all about uh, <clears throat> doing as, uh, you know, doing it for a down, working down to a budget, working down to a cost. Anyway. Uh, I'm not exhibiting this year. This is because Mark Allen, in his in his wisdom, uh, as far as I know, has decided to abolish the scheme whereby the associations get free stand space. Tony Reed, who was somewhat eccentric but uh, quite amiable, uh, uh, white-haired custodian of the old showcase, um, had had a policy of um, allowing small exhibition, uh, small associations, to come along free of charge and. It was the only way the smaller associations could come because, you know, if you work out that uh, uh, the smallest stand they do, which is about three metres by two metres, would normally cost about two, three thousand pounds. And then you've got uh, the cost of fitting it out and then hiring um, uh, hiring uh, electricity and stuff like that, which has to be done through their in-house mafia type supplier there's only one you know you have to use them and and you just have to swallow the price it doesn't matter what it is and then um, uh, you know you've got staff to pay and then the staff need to be put up in hotels and then they have to have meals and stuff like that so and it's quite a long exhibition I mean it's sort of some days it's nine till six I think or ten till five or something so and one person can't stand on a stand for seven hours solid not solid and Tony got upset if you left the stand you know if there was nobody on the stand to answer queries he would he would find you and say Look, there's nobody on your stand and you're like no Tony I've been standing up for four hours solid I've decided to go to the toilet well get back on your stand you know the, the least you can do is take two people and uh, and you know it takes quite a lot of uh, preparation because you have to take application forms you have to take magazines you have to hire magazine stands you need a, <clears throat> a vacuum cleaner because there's no you can't there's no vacuum cleaner for anybody to use if they need you know for all this crap and bits of sellotape and stuff that gets stuck all over the floor so it was all in all it was a bit of a pain you know so I'm not sorry not to go because it was expensive even if you got a free stand but now you don't even get the free stand so it's best basically gone you know I mean okay these guys have borrowed three or four million pounds to buy this exhibition I suppose they got to screw everybody to get as much money out of them as they can but I, I'm gonna be interested because last year was a bit quiet and I'll be interested to see what it's like this year my guess is and I'll feed back on this is it's gonna be even more quiet because uh, everything is dead you know the dental profession is dead I mean I've heard of NHS practices closing uh, for a day you know one day a week or something because um, they've managed to reorganize their patients into the remaining days and I'm sure this is I mean this is a UDA phenomenon isn't it I mean if you know if you're ahead of if you're ahead of your budget on the UDAs you're gonna need to shut the practice <laughs> you can have a day off can't you and in a way that was sort of envisaged you know Barry Cockcroft and Chris uh, what was his name anyway the senior civil servant the two senior civil servants that cooked up this UDA scheme they said, you know, you'll be able to cl close the practice and have more time for days off and things like that. Because you'll be able to plan, you know, you'll be on a fixed budget. And that's fair enough. Not very good for the patients, though. We find that the NHS say, no, your, your NHS surgery, which previously would have been open the whole time, is now shut on the day you want to go. Never convenient, is it, for a patient? But um, the idea is... You know, I mean, in the early days, what happened was that they used to just carry on working in the old way and uh, they would end up hitting their UDA target in the middle of February. 
and then uh, because you don't get paid for doing any extra work on the UDA system you'd have to pack up uh, either that or do work and, and take it forward into the next year or some other skullduggery but anyway trying to get a dentist in sort of March late March on the NHS was uh, impossible unless you managed to find someone who you know cocked it all up and was way behind with their UDA targets in which case you'd find a bloke who was working 16 hours a day and, and doing all sorts of stupidity in order to claim UDA points you know like uh, doing scaling polishing on the staff and stuff like that so anyway I'm in the market for a more up-to-date digital x-ray I'm sure there's something uh, there's, <laughs> there's got to be something it's more up-to-date than my di my digital x-ray uh, so uh, we'll see. I might see if I can get one of those handheld x-ray beams and see what and then I can sort of stop taking people next door to the um, x-ray unit. I can just do it in the surgery. And then I need, a, I need some sort of Wi-Fi or Bluetooth uh, probe, you know, uh, recept receptor. So that'll be great. I mean, if I can find something like that, then that'll be great. I'll... Uh, I need to just stick something in their mouth which is nice and small, size of a bite wing, stick a hair dryer on the side of their head and get the picture up on the screen straight away. Bosh, bosh, bosh. Hopefully through a USB dongle that's got no license fees attached and no rental. I mean, that'd be great, but that won't exist. You know, that won't. If, it, if that does exist, please write in and let me know. The BDIA are, and certainly under Tony Reid, I think they found themselves under a lot of pressure because of external um, uh, imports, you know, <clears throat> well, people are increasingly using Amazon, uh, eBay, Alibaba, etc. The, the tentacles of these international uh, sales firms are sort of stretched stretched into the UK now. And the idea that <clears throat> you know, if you wanted a new chair, you'd go and you'd, you'd have a chat with your man from Wright Cottrell and. He would, uh, you know, tell you what chair, in his opinion, he thought you ought to buy are all long gone. The Ken Davis years. And uh, so now, uh, you know, if you go and have a chat with a dentist, you might find he's got three surgeries and they're all kitted out from Hungary. Or they're all kitted out from Romania or Bulgaria or somewhere. And he's got these chairs for about £1,500 each or something, or £2,000 each. And all this equipment's all flooding in and... Uh, of course, this worries the BDIA. They are no, not, and you know they've made it all about safety and all about uh, patient safety and stuff like that because it's like that's the best bet, isn't it? From their point of view, they've got to make it about safety. Uh, it's like if you're trying to object to uh, encryption, then you say, well, it's all about this is all about child pornography. We're not really talking about privacy and security here. We're talking about child pornography. Don't you care about child? Well, what about the little children? Don't you care about child pornography? You know, if you care about child pornography, you should be against encryption. Well, I mean, that's the argument, but of course, it's, it's entirely specious. It's a straw man argument, and it's the same thing with the showcase. They're they're guilty of that. You know, they've got this. It's all about the safety of the patient. Don't you care about safety of the patient? I mean, you would not buy a chair or a drill or any materials on on eBay or Amazon if you cared about patient safety you know this has all got to be CE marked and double inspected and basically you've got to buy it from us because we're the guardians of safety um, and only only by buying stuff from us will you um, you know will you get what you what you should have and uh, as far as I know there's no requirement to buy it I mean, there may be a requirement, I suppose, to, to buy stuff that's safe and operate in a safe way, but I don't think there's an actual law that says you have to have a CE mark on every bit, everything you buy in this country. Uh, and a recent example is that my curing light. I mean, bought a curing light. I mean, if you go to Dental Directory's catalogue and, and look at curing lights, they start at 500 pounds and go up. If you go on um, <clears throat> Amazon, look at, at uh, curing lights, they start at um, eight pounds and go up. <laughs> They go up to about 35 and by you know by the time you're spending 35 you're getting a really good light <laughs> and I've proved this by buying um, uh, light sensors you know these light things that test the light 
And so I know that these these things are working and we test them all the time to make sure that they are working and, and we've saved hundreds of pounds. Now, that hundreds of pounds is that hundreds of pounds is what pays for showcase. And that's what the British Dental Industries Association is hoping that you won't save. They, they really are hoping that you you know, so I think they've gone the wrong way on this. They've been sort of caught on the left foot when they should be on the right foot. They've been caught in a recession trying to maintain the dental profession as a sort of a milk cow uh, of profit, you know, some in the same way as exhibitions are, uh, or sort of just produce a cash flow, you know, cash cow. Um, always used to be before the sort of competition came in and and the dental profession is seen as that you know you're, it's a standing joke that if you buy something which and anyone else would have to pay five pounds for as a dentist you have to pay 50 pounds for it you know just tiny bits of stuff just to keep your chair going oh it's all 100 pounds you know 150 pounds and because and this is all I think dates back to the late sort of 60s stereotype of dentist uh, having no end of money the, the you know the cost now of running a surgery are I would say pretty marginal I'm really I can't see a lot of I can't see how I mean, it's getting increasingly impossible to run a dental practice just looking at the costs certainly to do it properly I mean the way that people are very successful and make a lot of money is to do it improperly I'm not going to hide that you know that's that's an open secret within the profession my standing offer to anybody to let me into their surgery anyone who's Who's, who's daft enough to boast that they are making good money on the National Health Service and doing good quality dentistry. Just invite me I'll, at my expense. I'll come along, spend a day with you and find out how you're doing it. And, um, you know, if it's as miraculous as you say and you have found a way to make the NHS pay doing the best dentistry, then I will be more than willing to share that secret with the profession and the world because I think it's sort of, it should be shared. You know, you're forging ahead. Your leadership should be shared with everybody else. But if you're doing it, as I suspect, uh, by cutting corners and using cheap materials and taking insufficient time and telling people that teeth that could be saved uh, have no choice but to be taken out, then that would be exposed as well, wouldn't it? Which is why nobody's ever taken me up on this offer. So, <clears throat> so that's Showcase. We'll have, to see. we'll have to see what happens at Showcase. And then the last thing was this morning was a dentist complaining that the patients are being charged £100 for making false declarations that they're entitled to free NHS work when in fact they're not and or rather their their claim is being checked against a central database I should imagine of people who've got prescription certificates or something or I don't know but anyway people who are entitled to free dentistry and if the database <clears throat> says that you're not entitled then you're just issued a parking fine you know £100 fine no and the dentists obviously we were we were annoyed about this <clears throat> when this came in because patients were always able to tick the box to say that they were exempt but then they brought in a requirement for the for the dentist to check so far as possible the paperwork that supported the claim which made us the gatekeepers to the social social services and the dentists were complaining about this and uh, but it was brought in anyway and now what's happened is that where the claim is disallowed well I don't know whether or not the dentist has checked the paperwork what's happening is that um, the patients are then uh, who's the first point of contact the dentist they're going back to the surgeon saying look I ticked the box I've got a hundred pound fine why have I got this I need to appeal how do I appeal where do I get the forms from how do these forms are complicated what do I say how do I fill these forms in <coughs> excuse me so it's the receptionist who's getting the getting it in the neck isn't she and she's feeling obliged you know especially if she sees that the patient is exempt and that the Department of Health has made a mistake she feels obliged to help them fill in the appeal and so she's cross because it's wasting her time it's wasting the profession's time and I can see their point but, but what they're doing is that they're sort of they're um, you know we, we need to be more honest about why we're complaining we're complaining because we're being made um, gatekeepers to the social services and we shouldn't be we should it should be nothing to do with us the patient should come in they should either tick the box or not tick the box we don't care that's between them and the and the exemption people isn't it it's nothing to do with us and I would encourage if you are if you are a surgery that's affected by this and you are uh, 
being, you know, you are getting flack from the patients about the fact that the, the system's not working, I would, personally, I would wash my hands of it. I would just say, look, I'm sorry, this is absolutely nothing to do. This is between you and the social services. What, what box you tick, I don't even look. I do not even look what box you tick. Except that if you tick that box and I have to charge you and I tick that box, I don't. And if, and if you tick the box, I don't charge you, then it's between you and the social services what happens next. All right. So once again, storm in a teacup. Shouldn't happen. Shouldn't happen. Idiots in charge. All right. I'll, I might talk to you again before showcase. If not, I'll talk to you again afterwards. All right. Bye. Bye.